Welcome to Blackhawks Insider, the official podcast of the Chicago Blackhawks, presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com. Kaylee Chelios, Colby Cohen here. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast platform you use, and like all of our YouTube pages, as well as videos that are posted on the Blackhawks YouTube page. Well, Colby, less than 24 hours ago, the Blackhawks uh, received the very first pick in the 2023 NHL Draft. You were in studio for NBC Sports. I was in the FanDuel Lounge at the United Center with the executive team, the analytics guys who probably had the best reaction of anybody. <laughs> needed a GoPro for them alone on the conversations and everything that were happening as each team uh, got announced until that first pick. Uh, let's start with you. What was it like in studio with Pat and Charlie? Your thoughts leading into eventually what was um, the top three as we went to commercial break and we awaited to see what the Hawks future looked like. Well, driving to NBC, I was sitting in the car convincing myself for some reason, I was like, we're going to end up with the number two pick. I don't know why. I just had a feeling um, like, I think this is how it's going to play out. We're going to get number two. It's going to be, that's going to be a huge win. It's all, it's all good. So that was sort of my expectation when I got to NBC Pat Boyle was so fired up. Like, he was so excited, anxious, nervous, you know, fired up. And then Charlie was was kind of dialed into his computer. He had, like, all the different Twitter windows going. Um, he was probably writing an article while we were doing the show. You know, and then, and then we're watching, and we're sitting there at the desk, the one, you know, obviously you know it well. Um, and we're watching, you know, Chalk. Like, things are happening the way we need them to happen. And when number five comes along and, and Montreal gets hits the fifth pick, we, we, we had, like, a big sigh of relief because Montreal, for some reason, was, like, a big worry. We thought they were going to sneak in. They were going to get it. Um, and then right before they go to commercial break, Kevin Weeks kind of has that little slip-up about Columbus. So immediately we all start going to our phones to text people. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I actually was texting with Kyle and he was like, we heard that too. So then Pat and I are like celebrating. We're like, we definitely got the top two picks. This is awesome. Like this is a win no matter what. We come back from commercial card flips. I'm jumping up and down. Pat's jumping up and down. Like we're missing each other on the high fives. Um, you know, we were fired up. Charlie, obviously he's like working away over there, like right to business. <laughs> you know, he was excited, but he's like business, business. I got to work. Um, you know, and then basically I was just watching the videos of you guys at the United center, seeing all your Instagrams, like with the worst FOMO, I'm like, why? Like, <laughs> I wish we could have done the show. It would have been so cool if we did the show at the United center. So I know that was long winded, but that, that was the night for me. Obviously it looked like you guys had a lot of fun too. We did. It was crazy. The mood before the draft, you know, just seconds before they quickly started going through each team as it was getting picked. And then after the Blackhawks got the first overall, I mean, energy isn't the way to describe it. The emotion, the relief, the excitement, every different department just on their phones getting ready. And um, I kind of I was talking to somebody actually in retail who was saying, like, typically you cannot sell the jersey of a player that is drafted until they play in their first NHL game, but there may be an exception for Connor Bedard, um, depending on you know who gets him and what happens, which is pretty insane. He's not at 18 years old and just having an insane impact on the game, um, potentially on this organization, and it was just surreal. Um, I, you know, you thought we were going to get the second. I was like fourth or first. And as each team got called, it was kind of like when you're gambling and you have that smooth feeling like I'm hot, I'm winning. And it was like, I felt <laughs> cool as a cucumber going down the stretch. I was like, I just feel like we're not going to see it till number one. And then we did. Uh, Kyle came out so excited. Everyone was cheering. Danny Wirtz, I think, did two or three rounds of high fives to every single person um, <laughs> in that room. The excitement level was off the charts. Everybody was just like, wow, couldn't believe it. Total shock and excitement. So I do wish you guys were there for that part of it, but um, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And uh, Twitter, like you said, was was crazy just having heard half the room knew from looking at Twitter that Kevin Weeks had said that, and the other half had no idea. So the rest of us were just waiting in anticipation for who was going to 
be drawn next. So it was exciting. It was a lot of fun. And I still can't believe, you know, how quickly things changed in an hour, basically, for this organization. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you just like, and just talking to like our colleagues and ticketing, corporate partnerships, like I'm so happy for them. I mean, their jobs hopefully just got a little bit easier. They've been, they've been fighting an uphill battle for the last couple of years. And they're some of the hardest working, you know, biggest, uh, most important members of the organization. They never get credit. They're never on TV. Like we're on TV, like we're front facing. They're behind the scenes doing all the dirty work. So I'm happy for them. Um, you know, it's, it's incredible. The whole city's buzzing. I mean, it's the whole city is buzzing. Uh, requests. I mean, I, I did Leafs radio earlier, something like, why would the Leafs ever ask me to do radio? You know, one of their radio shows during the day, cause they want to, they want to talk about the first overall pick. So all in good fun. We had an awesome guest that joined us. Um, a guy who was in the room in Secaucus, New Jersey, took us, you know, uh, takes us through the entire process of what he saw um, what a, what an awesome opportunity to get Frank Saravalli on the pod today. I think everybody's really going to enjoy hearing from him. Frank, thank you so much for joining us. Less than 24 hours after the Blackhawks received the very first pick in the 2023 NHL draft. It was a madhouse at the United Center, but you had one of the most unique perspectives yesterday actually in New Jersey, in the draft lottery room, where the balls were selected. Can you take us inside that room, Frank? What was it like in there? First off, I'm glad to have my phone back. I was uh, sequestered <laughs> in the group, and one of the first things they do when you walk in is uh, you got to give your phone over to NHL security. They put it in an envelope, they seal it, and it's gone. So uh, you're not communicating with anyone from the outside. And second, it's also a really small room. So like there's a lot of people packed in there. You've got the lottery machine. You've got the commissioner. You've got uh, someone that handles the lottery machine. And then someone from Ernst & Young, the auditing firm that uh, walks through the entire process to make sure it's all on the up and up. And a couple of reporters, staff members, all those things. So I wanted to sort of set the scene for you. It's a small little conference room inside the NHL Network Studios in uh, New Jersey, right in the shadow of Manhattan. And it's, um, I was really shocked at how intense it is. Um, yes, there's this protocol that, that's in place. Uh, there's these rules that are read. If you watch the video, Gary Bettman, the commissioner, speaks for 10 minutes, essentially outlining how everything works. Um, he proves that in the video today is May 8th. He holds up a copy of the paper uh, for posterity, all those things uh, that go into it. It's, it's So there's the surgical sort of process of it, which I kind of expected because I've seen the video before. But what I wasn't expecting was how intense the moment is when they draw the balls because there's a thousand and one different combinations and possibilities for these balls. And... <clears throat> essentially going from three to four, ball three to four, you know, you can sort of look on your sheet and begin to figure out what are the potential landing spots. And in the room in that exact moment in time, you could kind of like, you could cut the air with a knife. It's intense to think about all the different things that happen from that part of which now we're talking about with all the excitement in Chicago. So then Frank, as you're sitting there, these balls are, are getting picked um, you know, you, you beautifully kind of explained just now how it happens, but once that final ball does get picked, uh, and, and you guys are all probably sitting there writing down, realizing that it's going to be Chicago, what was the mood in that room? Like at that point, um, when, when that final ball was pulled. So Colby, that's, what's really interesting is there is no mood. It's, it's very sterile. Like there, no one has any that no one that's in the room out there. So there's two uh, team representatives, two teams sent a representative to sort of oversee the process. One was the Philadelphia Flyers. They sent someone from uh, their analytics staff, Tom Minton to oversee it. Um, obviously right up the road from Philly, hop on the Jersey Turnpike, easy to get there. The Arizona Coyotes, they uh, sent the owner's son, Alex Maruello Jr. So those two are the only guys in the room that have any rooting interest at all. 
the so they they read aloud um the five balls like what the winning combination was and just for the record it was five 13 four and then nine so nine was the winner for the hawks uh they had two uh options in that final 11 uh to actually land the pick so they had some of the best odds going into that final ball which is interesting but the reaction the auditor, like, so So Gary Bettman reads, he goes 5, 13, 4, and 9. He says, Scott Clark is the guy from Ernst & Young. Scott, uh, wh- you know, what is, who does that combination belong to? And he says, the Chicago Blackhawks. And then Gary Bettman just says, the Chicago Blackhawks have won the first overall pick. And then immediately, it's right into the next pick, the next draw for number two. There's no emotion, there's no gasp, there's no celebration, nothing. It's very, very quiet. And so you all know then for the next three hours, is that how long you had to wait before you get your phones back and the entire world gets to find this out? What is that like? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really weird yeah, feeling. How did especially... you not text me? I'm like so annoid finding this out about you, Frank. <laughs> yeah, so you could use a pigeon, carrier pigeon to send Colby. <laughs> especially as someone who deals in, in news as, as an insider, that was really hard to sit there and a really weird feeling not just knowing like, okay, all the excitement that's in Chicago and how excited Kyle, Kyle Davidson and, and Jamie Faulkner and Danny Wirtz are going to be in the Wirtz family, but also thinking about like, hey, Connor Bernard's life has changed in such a huge way. And now he's going to be, you know, likely if he's the guy picked by the Blackhawks at number one, going to be spending the next however many years of his life living in Chicago. So like you, that's when your brain starts to explode of like all these different things that could be happening with information that you and maybe like 10 other people in the room know and no one else. So you guys are all getting ready for the draft party, uh, the watch party, Colby's heading to the studio. You guys are going to have your show on NBC. All those things are happening and meanwhile, for all like for 90 minutes prior to the show, I'm just sitting there like, should I have some chicken fingers from the buffet now? Like what like what do I do with myself? Cause I can't leave and I don't have my phone. It's definitely a strange, strange feeling. Well, I'm I'm getting the vibes of basically like being in maybe fourth or fifth grade and being in detention, uh, in a small room, no cell phone, can't really do much. Other than the no cell phone. I, I never went to detention just yeah, so you know. You like, that's a we Colby were, we thing. Were, there we go. We were, friends. Yeah. we were friends as kids. You you spend time in detention too. I'm not taking that whatsoever. We'll get your dad on the horn and we'll we'll find out the truth about that. But other than the no cell phone thing, were there any other rules of the room? Like were you guys allowed to speak to each other? Were you had to sit still? And did Gary Bettman, did he get to keep his phone? Like, is it just no phones for some? It's not for all? Like, get, give us give us the lowdown on some other ins and outs of that room. Yeah, so Gary Bettman could keep his phone and he could he had an Apple Watch on, so he kept that on as well. If you had a, a smartwatch or a laptop, you also had to give that up. Um, but he, he actually stayed with us, like sequestered in the room for... I'd say the entire time right up until the show started. And then once ESPN went live, he just walked down the hallway and into the studio to watch the, the actual proceedings in person. Um, he was the only person then in the studio that actually knew. So Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly, as he's flipping the cards, he doesn't know. Uh, and when he sees the logo for the first time, like basically holding it up for the camera, that's the first time he learns about it. Um, which I found really interesting as well. And the, the vibe in the room is sort of very, um, it was very conversational. It was lighthearted. Uh, I've spent a lot of time around Commissioner Bettman in my career. And I would say that is like about as, as at ease as I've seen him. Um, he had his grandson with him, Matthew, uh, who's in high school. You know, he's very proud talking of of Matthew's hockey accomplishments and and all those things. We talked about the playoffs and, you know, different stuff going on. So it was really conversational both before and after. But for that, you know, 20, it's like 16 to 20 minute chunk of time where he's reading the rules and there's all this protocol and, you know, actually helping conduct the lottery itself. Then it's like business as usual and it's, it's really intense. But otherwise, it was like it was a really cool thing to witness, I think, 
I've been around the NHL for 15 years now. I've never gone and done it. I actually asked, like I went out of my way to ask and say, hey, this is like taking place near me. I only live an hour away. Can I come and watch? And there were two other reporters in there. And I'm really glad that I did for a number of reasons. One, uh, because it is historic and you see Connor Bedard and, and his likely his future, um, you know, and where that's going. But also, too, because there's all this talk out there and you, I'm sure you guys have seen it. Oh, this process is rigged. Of course they want Connor Bedard or the number one pick to go to Chicago. Huge market of importance for the NHL. And I can just tell you watching it with my own eyes and seeing how the entire thing unfolds, that could not be further from the truth. So um, I appreciate anyone with their uh, controversial social media tinfoil hat take, but there's just like, <laughs> it's so buttoned up. It's so dialed in that there's, there's just nothing there. I can tell you like um, God's honest truth from my lips to, uh, to his ears. Well, that's very true, Frank, everyone who is saying that. The only people who would really know that are the people involved in that room watching the actual balls get picked and how that happened. So you were one of those people. And unlike in the room, the United Center went crazy. Kyle Davidson addressed the staff afterward, and he had said he was not nervous. He thought, okay, I'm prepared to take third or fourth. They had a game plan. That was it, no nerves. And then just the energy from him, Danny Wirtz, Jamie Faulkner, everybody high-fiving. He was absolutely elated with the opportunity. You put out a couple really great stories. What was your conversation like with Kyle Davidson and what this opportunity means to him and, and how you see this? Yeah, so we actually traded messages um, earlier on Monday. And it was kind of just like, I think there was a sense from Kyle Davidson that they were just excited. The Blackhawks were excited to know what was going to happen. Like, hey, we, you know, wherever we're picking, uh, A, we're going to get a really good player, and B, it's nice to just finally know instead of the unknown that exists out there. So you can really kind of begin to plan and, and start to, you know, think about what, you know, let's say if they were picking third or fourth, like, hey, let's game plan out the different scenarios of who might possibly go before then so we can then start to think about what our organization looks like. And so now that you have the pick of the litter, um, that just provides so much more flexibility. I think I'm really confident and a lot of people are in, in knowing what direction they're going to go down, but just knowing. And I think the other part too is when you have the number one pick and you have that type of talent, that is now at your disposal, you've now accomplished what I think is the hardest part of a rebuilding process. You've got the one piece that really hardly anyone can ever get their hands on in terms of that level of skill and talent. And so um, I think that part, you know, the fun now begins in now trying to, to plot and plan. You've got all these other great draft picks. And, and many more to come, like the fact that there's another one still in the first round and the three that you had last year, plus all of the second rounders and the multiple years ahead oh, which you have oh, also that first round picks. That's NHL where you start to get really Wall excited because you can start to see it all come together. Whereas you're dealing before Kelly and Kobe in the abstract. It's like, yeah, like we, we want to do this. We want to go execute and, and come back with Blackhawks 2.0 after um, Jonathan Caves and Patrick Kane, but we don't know who that is or what it looks like, and, and frankly, when we're going to be able to get there. And so now you start to be like, okay, we can see it, whether it's, you know, it goes from five years to three years or whatever the timeline ends up being. When you have that type of player available to you, you have really the ability to speed it up in a significant way. And, and that's great news for Blackhawks fans. Um, that's great news for the people that are trying to plan it and put it all together because there's still a lot of work to be done and still probably some tough years ahead um, to get there. But you can sort of start to see the, the finished product and you're like, that is really exciting. Yeah, and, and one thing I've appreciated so much about how Kyle's handled this whole thing has just been how even-keeled he is. And I know that's his nature. 
Um, you know, I know Kaylee and I get to be around him all the time. Frank, I know you, um, you know, have a, a, a solid relationship with the organization. And, and I think just seeing him talk about how this is very important, but we're still on a plan here and we're not going to blow up our plan for, for one thing, because we want to be sustained and build the success. And, you know, one thing uh, Kaylee did mention earlier with you are some of the things you tweeted last night. And one of them um, was a photo about the good luck charms that, that Kyle had. And, and I'm just curious, how did you learn about that? And, you know, I, I think that that really humanizes these things for people. And I think people have to realize, you know, Kyle's a 34 year old guy. He's a new dad. Um, he's in his first year as a general manager I mean, things have gone well. He's drafted well. He's made s slick little trades, um, big trades, little trades. They've all kind of worked out well for him so far. But I think the human side is, is important to remember. And when you tweeted the photo you did on your Twitter, I, I think that was a pretty touching moment. So maybe you could describe that a little bit about how that kind of came about and, and maybe tell our listeners that haven't seen that tweet, you know, what that was all about. Yeah, so you're a new dad. I'm a dad. Um, it just kind of like hit me right in in the feels. Um, getting, you know, sort of insight like that because it it does it humanizes it. And I think just to tell the story, if if you missed it, um, about forty minutes before the show began, um, Kyle said that he wrote um, some names on his hand, uh, Emmy and Willa. And Willa is his four-month-old daughter, and Emmy is uh, the daughter that he and his wife lost. That's the name that they picked, um, you know, midway through a pregnancy in 2021. So you always carry those things with you, I think. Um, and I think, too, like, it, it speaks to a number of things. One, um, how, how successful he wants to be, how family is intertwined in that. Um, I also think it speaks to... Um, his transparency. And I think that's one of the things that I've appreciated most about my interactions with Kyle and the Blackhawks organization in the last few years has been, they have a real concern for process and how they're doing things. They want to do it the right way. And instead of, you know, another, I hear stories or stuff like that, little tidbits all the time um, with all sorts of different people, GMs and organizations, agents, players that I talk to, and not everyone would want that out there. And so I just, you know, I just checked in with him and said, Hey, do you mind? And he's like, yeah, please, by all means, share it. And not everyone's as front and center with something, especially like that with Emmy, that could be, is heartbreaking. Um, and so he was willing to, to share it. And I appreciate that. And I think that just speaks to the overall transparency that they've had in terms of what they're building here that has made it so exciting. Yeah, Kyle is absolutely brilliant. And like you said, I think his transparency and how direct he is with all of us on a daily basis is something we can all relate to. And that was a really great story that you broke and picture as well, Frank. You just mentioned that there are other organizations and GMs that do kind of superstitious good luck charm things. Is there anything that you could share with us? Any other tidbits that other GMs have done for good luck or any of the wild stories that you've heard in the years? Nothing that really comes to mind. I saw there was a couple funny tweets from some teams on social media on Monday, uh, hoping that they'd be able to find some. I'm sure every GM has its, <laughs> his own sort of uh, ritual or whatever it might be to uh, whether it's preparing for a game or the routine that they go through. Maybe they echo the same thing on draft lottery day. Um, it's, it's just amazing to think of like, that's sort of what hits you when you're in the room too, is like the sheer randomness of it all. Like these are quite literally ping pong balls floating in the air. It's what decides who wins the mega millions. It's what decides who gets the right to select Connor Bedard. Uh, lives like quite literally are changing on an instant. And the gravity of that situation, I think is what grabs you. Yeah, like we're talking about hockey and uh, something super exciting. Uh, like this and it's all in good fun but like 
you know, jobs are on the line. People like for the teams that didn't win the draft lottery in Columbus and in Anaheim and other places, like you're dealing now with a different reality than what you had yesterday morning when you woke up. So um, there are like ramifications and permutations. And I think also for the Blackhawks and what they're building, it, it reminds you too, like watching a team like Edmonton now um, in, in the second round and the success that they've had with Connor McDavid um, just being absolutely ridiculous as the best player in the world is that you're, the way people perceive and view your organization changes now too. People want to come there. Not that people haven't wanted to play in Chicago. It's an unbelievable place to live and great market and rabid fan base. But, you know, you get in, in Edmonton, the coldest, most northern outpost in the league, people want to be surrounded by greatness. And, you know, the United Center has seen that for a long time with Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane. They saw it before that with Michael Jordan. You know, these players that come along every now and again are so far and few between that, you know, to see, to have an opportunity to, to surround yourself with that, it's a big deal. Well, Frank, we, uh, we appreciate your time today. I know you're a busy guy, and I'm going to ask you one final question. Hopefully it's a softball, but you'll let me know. Is there any surprises coming on draft night in Nashville, or are we going to see – one two happen like we think it is i look i have never pretended to be a draft expert um i stay right in my sort of nhl insider world i have enough hard time keeping track of 32 teams i don't need to throw in college and junior hockey in the mix uh however i've because connor bedard is so special i've sort of done my own you know, due diligence and work on that end and spent a lot of time talking to people that he knows and has played with and for. And, you know, he really seems to live up to the hype. I think Adam Fantilli in any other normal year um, would be a clear cut number one overall pick, no questions asked. So the people that I trust, since I'm not a draft expert, uh, they don't seem to have any doubt as to what the order is. And so I think where the real intrigue begins on draft night in Nashville on a Wednesday night, by the way, is going to be, you know, reserved for starting at the number three pick. Well, Frank, as Kyle said, it's, it's still going to be a monster player uh, that's going to help this rebuild, and we're all really excited for it. Thank you so much for joining us. Great job, great stories. We really enjoyed your work over the course of this, and We'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday at the draft if you're going to be in and around Nashville. Oh, I will be there all week. My pleasure, guys. Great to be with you. All right. Thanks, Frank. Take care. Great stuff from your childhood friend, Colby, Frank Saravalli. Always great to have an NHL insider like him who's working around the clock um, to talk with us less than 24 hours after the Blackhawks get the number one pick at the 2023 NHL draft. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have all the latest coverage, news, the very first interview with our number one pick at the draft later on in June. So we're very excited for that uh, on the Blackhawks Insider. For Colby Cohen, I'm Kaylee Chelios. Stay tuned.